Hi there, and welcome to the Nerds of Business podcast. My name's Darren Moffat. I'm a director at WebBuzz, the growth marketing agency, and I'm your host. It's great to have you with us. We're about to dive into the very first episode, but before we do, I'd like to briefly explain how this podcast works and what we hope to achieve. Nerds of Business is a bit different from other podcasts. It has a unique structure. We do the show in seasons of about 10 episodes each. The seasons are themed on a broad topic, and each episode attempts to solve one key challenge within that topic that all entrepreneurs must overcome. So you can see we're trying to problem solve the entrepreneurial journey, which is pretty ambitious when you think about it. And that's where the nerds come in. In each episode, I talk to a rotating cast of experts and top entrepreneurs in a quest for answers. You'll hear both the technical perspectives and the real-life true stories you need to apply any learnings. My vision for the show is to make you feel more confident and optimistic about your own journey as a leader or business owner. It's all about you. That's why we exist. That's why we're here. And I want to thank you in advance for the privilege of your time. With that, let's get into the first episode of the first season on Branding. I love data. I, I love kind of looking through the data. You need to have systems. You need to have structure. You're going to get chopped to pieces. Enthusiasm is unstoppable. We kind of hit a point where we were like, we need another leader. Surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and richer than you. <laughs> this is Nerds of Business. So the title of today's episode and the problem we're trying to solve is... How to create a brand identity that's so good, it can take you from a startup to potentially a $100 million valuation. If you're launching a business or you're a new entrepreneur, this episode will hold particular interest. But if you're a business owner with an existing brand identity, you'll also get a lot of value from what you're about to hear. And that even applies if you're satisfied with your brand identity. I think you'll pick up ideas from our guests that will create opportunities for leveraging your brand in new and exciting ways. Brands are fluid. They change over time. They regularly need to be updated and refreshed, and sometimes just a small tweak can make the world of difference, which is exactly what you'll hear in our feature story. Later in the episode, I speak with Andre Eichmeier, the founder of online wine retailer Vino Mofo. Andre shares the incredible tale of how just a one letter change in the brand name was a key inflection point for taking them from struggling startup to a $100 million valuation. Here's a sneak peek. So it was, it was going to be called Vino Mojo and it was a whole thing around because it was going to be like a wine deal site. It was actually going to be a group buying site. We got like a, a letter from a trademark attorney and it was an objection to the trademark by a public listed company. Okay. who had a wine called Mojo. Right. right. Mind you, this was like the Friday before the Monday we were going to launch. You know, and I don't know if any of you listening have like, you know, been three days out from the launch of a website for something. That's probably There's a lot of yeah. happening, right? Yeah. There's a lot of moving parts, pretty stressful. <laughs> you probably know when you're ready. You're not sleeping much. We were in that state and got this letter, opened it. And so we were like, <laughs> um, what do we do? Okay. Hopefully that's whet your appetite. We're about to get into it. But before we do, let's take a trip back in time. The year is 2700 BC. In ancient Egypt, cattle farmers used the banks of the Nile River to graze their livestock. But poachers and thieves are rife. To combat the loss of cattle and their income, the farmers set upon a simple solution. They burn a distinctive symbol into the flesh of their animals to signify ownership. The mark stops thieves from being able to profit from stolen goods. How did they do it? With a hot branding iron. The cows don't like it, but this is how the concept of branding as we know it begins and where the word derives its modern meaning. Jump forward 4,700 years and branding has come a long way. Today, it's a vast industrial complex across agencies, an array of channels and platforms that companies use to defend 
and grow their brands. In fact, the global advertising industry is worth $560 billion. That's a massive number. So we think we know what a brand is. It's the logo, right? Well, not quite. That's not the full story. The meaning for a brand has shifted subtly over time. What, in fact, does a brand mean today? A brand really is what you stand for. So it's not just a logo. And what you really want to do, it's all of those, if you think of an existing brand, it's all of the perceptions and experiences that everybody has associated with that brand. So is it safe? Is it reliable? Is it friendly? Is it orange? Is it purple? Is it black? You know, all of those different associations. Um, is it for, is it fresh? Is it for, is it for lunchtime? Is it for um, flying? Is it for, so what are, what are all of those various associations that people have with a brand? That's Rachel Bevins from The Healthy Brand Company. She's worked with some of the biggest brands in the world, including Mastercard, Glenfiddich Scott and News Corp. And she's the perfect person for a series on branding. In fact, she's one of our two major brand experts and you'll be hearing a lot from her through the course of this series. So that might surprise you. A brand is not just a logo. It's what you stand for and it's everything that your customers experience around that brand. Let's hear why it's so important. I spoke to John Michael from The Image Group. John is a leading uh, image consultant, personal branding guru from Melbourne. He's been uh, in this game for three decades. He's a complete legend. And listen to what John has to say. Well, it matters more than ever. It matters more than ever because it, co- it actually complements everything about direct response, everything. Um, and this is especially so for small business and entrepreneurs, okay? Big corporations do things differently. So sales and growth are essential, yeah? Mm-hmm. We know that, especially in today's current market. But so is reputation, and that's what branding is. It builds a reputation because it builds trust and credibility. And also, if you want to sell the business, you've got something to sell. People, you know, people are buying, if you're going to sell the business, they're not buying the business, they're buying the brand. Coca-Cola, 66% of its value is based on the name, not yeah. the bricks and mortar. Can you believe that? Yeah, that's an amazing uh, stat. I haven't yeah. heard that one before. It's yeah. unbelievable, right? So, you know, so the brand power is everything. Uh, and look at Google. Do I have to say any more? I love what John said there about direct response, that any investment you make in branding complements direct response, that it in fact can amplify the return you get off direct response marketing. And so I think it's important for me to just pause for a minute here and give listeners a little bit of an explanation around how the marketing industry works. Because if you are not familiar with the structure of the marketing advertising world, um, you might get a little bit lost here. So there essentially there are two camps. There are the, the branding people and there are the direct response people. The branding people are those marketers that focus more on building iconic brands through you know, television, radio, print, broadcast media, essentially. And the direct response people are those who focus more on immediate sales. And traditionally, they have worked in telesales and direct mail. These days, it's more um, digital marketing, lead, gen- lead generation, paid search, and so on. In the past, or traditionally, there's been a lot of tension between those two groups. But What John is saying and what you're also about to hear from another guest is that it doesn't have to be that way. And in fact, it's better when there is a hybrid approach. You can achieve a better result with your marketing. And that's what you're about to hear from Fred Shabesta. Fred is the co-founder of finder.com.au, a very large business here in Australia, $250 million market capitalization and the leader in comparison. Let's hear what Fred's got to say. And that kind of leads me to a bit of time travel I want to do. I went into the Wayback Machine ah. and I, uh, I looked at your webs- various websites uh, over the years and I can see that the branding was pretty minimal until about 2013. Mm-hmm. Um, now, feel free to reject the premise of this question, but my observation is that I'd say that with your background in SEO and digital marketing, you put, until that point, a priority on data and direct response. When did you become a branding convert and what has that journey taught you? It's a great question and, and extremely observant of you. And, you know, I'm thinking about some of the influences I had. One was uh, the book Story Wars. I read that and, and that, that affected me. And I was like, what is our story? Why are people going to buy into this? Well, who cares? 
And I don't think that we I really had an answer for that. You know, we, we bumbled around with it. Um, but I think today there is this beauty in the rawness and transparency and just sheer um, authenticity of Finder that people go, hey, you know, they're not perfect, but here they are. You know, and I think people go, hey, that's cool. I like that. So I think that's an aspect. I think the second thing of the change was I read a book uh, called Zero to One, mm-hmm. um, you know, a very provocative book, um, a, a Peter Thiel book, and in it he talked about defensive moats. Okay. And I realized, I said, you know, being really great at search engine marketing or, you know, being great at digital advertising uh, in all sorts of tenants and forms is not defensive. Mm-hmm. What is defensive? is a brand. And so we really rallied the idea of internally inside Finder committing the investment to build a brand. And and that's a major decision, right? It's a huge expense and a cost and and time and energy. And you're exactly right. You you know, you really uh, captured that essence. And in the past, I'd say branding was like, oh, that's that's a, that's a nasty word inside Finder. It's direct marketing, you know, where's our CPA and yep. our cost to acquire and, you know, those kind of things, right? Conversion rates and we love that stuff. And we still do. Yep. There's a beauty to it. But then we thought, hey, can you be branded and deliver a direct response? And there's a hybridness. There's a real art to that. So that's Fred from finder.com.au. You'll be hearing a lot more from Fred over the course of this series. He's given us some amazing nuggets of wisdom and insight. According to Inc.com, there are thought to be 500,000 significant brands globally, not to mention the millions of small and local businesses. So it's pretty clear a really effective brand identity is essential if you want to stand out and grab some market share in your local industry or market. For the technical perspective, I turn to Rachel Bevins again from The Healthy Brand Company to find out what components actually make up a brand identity. Your identity has four key elements. One is the visual identity that we've touched on, and that includes your logo, your photography or your imagery style and your illustration style, your fonts, your uh, and key visual elements. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of your visual identity. It includes your Uh, verbal identity or your voice, your tone of voice and Mm -hmm. what sort of words you use and what language you use. Mm -hmm. It includes your um, all the other sensory components. So sound is a big one that people are talking about at the moment, but it's been used for absolutely years, whether it's the shut of the the car door or how the Apple little um, blinks. Or the Siri, the Siri effect. The Siri effect, exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, brands have been doing that using sensory for years mm. and then um, the third the fourth element is behavioral elements so how does the brand behave as a brand but also how do your people behave so what are the um, behaviors of your, your brand because they're all the things that people will then identify with your brand make up your identity so it turns out there are four key elements towards brand identity this is particularly important for online marketing again you might be a little bit surprised that logos and brand identities are are so crucial for effective online marketing. But they are. And for this, I turn to my business partner and perhaps a person I I trust the most around online marketing, Ben Carew from WebBuzz, the growth marketing agency. Uh, I I gave Ben a call to find out why brand identity is so important for paid search and online marketing. Listen to what he's got to say. Hello? Hey, hey, mate, how are you? Uh, hey, how's it going? Yeah, good, good. Hey, I'm, I'm doing that episode on branding, brand identity for Nerds of Business. And oh, yeah? I, I just, I had a question. What was that statistic you always quote about online conversion? Oh, you mean the one about um, uh, it only takes 2.8 seconds to convert the user or they bounce off the page. That's they the one. They forever. That's the one, yeah, right. So you've got like a really small window when you get someone to your, to your website uh, or your webpage, you've got a really small window of time to, to convert them. Otherwise, they're gone, right? Yeah, and they won't come back either, especially if you're using landing pages for paid traffic. You know, there's no way to find your way back there anyway unless you bookmark it or go and click on the ad again. But generally speaking, yeah, you've lost them. Yeah, right. So what role does a brand identity or a logo play in that? 
Well, it, it communicates trust. Um, obviously, if you're a known brand, trust is baked in. So that, that's the best you could hope for. Um, but generally speaking, um, I mean, we've run campaigns for mortgage lead generation. I mean, hundreds of campaigns over, over the last few years, mm-hmm. as you would know. And um, those pages, whenever, they're all for different businesses. So they're all landing pages for different businesses, paid traffic uh, from Facebook and Google leading to them. So the vast, vast, vast majority of, of users from those ads that hit that page will not know the business on the page. Yep. And we've seen a real correlation between the poorly designed identities and brand identities because the pages are branded with that with that mortgage broker's business. Mm-hmm those bad logos and identities just simply convert less. Um, and how much, how much less? Like, is it, does it have a material impact? Oh, absolutely. Um, the campaigns can cease. If the, if the logo is terrible, you know, the campaigns can cease to function, really. Yeah, right. um, and, and certainly, as far as the lead generator goes, it makes the campaign unviable um, yeah. for us. But, but even, even with a brand where the, the user doesn't know that business, at all, and as I said, it's the vast majority of them. Um, as, if the logo has some gravitas, if it's well designed, if it's you know got a nice color scheme, or you know it doesn't look frankly cheap and nasty, um, then that people tend to kind of be okay with that, even though, though they don't know the business. Yeah. So if a small business has, if they've just one crappy logo, they've been running for years. They might not necessarily know, or they'll struggle to uh, be aware that that's the cause of a low conversion rate. So, but if they have a suspicion that might be the case, the only real way to test it is to do a, a different type of logo and run, a, run an A/B test on, on on the other logo and see if the results are better. That's that's correct. Uh, the as far as small business goes, so one of the problems they'll run into is 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 low conversion rate to begin with. So if it's a small business website, you've got the issue of not reaching statistical significance in any of those tests. Mm -hmm. So you really do have to have a bit of a rule of thumb or you have to go with a bit of gut, which isn't obviously, you know, it's slightly frowned upon in digital marketing because the the idea and the promise of digital marketing is that you have data and you make data-driven decisions. But for small business websites, it's a constant problem because they never get the amount of conversions required. By the way, that's at least 100 conversions to be able to make a, a proper statistically based judgment on on which is the winning test. Yep. So I think I think for, for any listeners out there, the, the takeaway here is just if you have a small business website and you suspect that your logo is not great, um, you know, do a bit of a vox pop or go on a site like Polefish mm-hmm. um, and and do a user test on various t- various versions of your logos. Find one that resonates and and use that and see if you get a better result on your site. Yeah, and I guess the trick there is not just to trust family and friends because it, that's is it that's pretty notorious for being inaccurate, isn't it? Like they they'll only kind of tell you what you want to hear usually. Oh yeah, yeah. No, family, family and friends are to be avoided, <laughs> except in, <laughs> except in social circumstances. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. So it's really clear. You need a great brand identity, whether you're doing online marketing or not. But it's especially important for converting traffic into leads, which is so much of what we do uh, in business these days for for marketing. So now we're going to go into the technical aspects of how to create a brand identity. There is a formal process that you can follow as a small business owner to get the best result for your own brand identity. Let's again listen to what Rachel Bevins from The Healthy Brand Company has to say on this process. Yeah, so it really is strategy first. So you look at, you do the research and strategy component first, yep. mm-hmm. and then you can go into the ver- into the um, identity, the ideation piece, mm-hmm. into the concept okay. creation, the concept development, and then into sort of your design fo- uh, final de- design development and design finalization when yep. you go to final artwork. And so the strategy phase is um, really looking at the customers, who is the audience, what, is the, what does the category look like, who are the competitors and, and what, is the, what is the brand 
stand for? What are the, what are, what are the, sorry, what are the special things about the brand or the product? You know, what makes it unique and what makes it different? So depending if yep. it's a product, it'll be about its provenance or um, craftsmanship or where the supply comes from or what have you. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're looking for those or how it's how it was started in the first place. So you're looking for all of those mm-hmm. brand truths um, and what makes what makes the product or the service really special. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, I guess you're going through and you're setting, A, you're setting your objectives. Yep. <laughs> mm-hmm. So what do you want to achieve with the brand? Uh, then it's who, is you to, who you're talking to, how, how, who are your competitors out there in the marketplace and is your product and brand all about and so from those you'll be able to then look at you know where the gap is in the market so that yep. you can identify what your brand stands for. okay great and so once you've got the strategy done uh for you know for the brand identity what happens next where does it go to after that Okay, so the other part of the strategy bit is obviously related to the design as well. Yep. So um, you, while you're doing that, you will also have a look at the category codes. So you'll see, you know, in health, if you're in a health food, looking at health food, you'll go mm. and have a look at the category, all the category codes there, you know, which is pretty much, you know, green, white, <laughs> yep. creams, browns. So this is the visual language of each category. There's exactly. an established visual language. Exactly. Yeah, okay. And then you need to decide, go through that, through the design process. You need to actually go back at those, look at those category codes and say, which ones do we want to st- stick with so that consumers know that we're in that category. And that's kind of, that becomes almost like a trigger. Exactly. Yeah, got it. Exactly. So someone can trigger immediately, you're green, yes. you're in the healthy it's food shorthand category. for what the brand represents. So yep. it gets you into the into the the zone or the territory yeah exactly uh, into the ballpark so to speak and then from there the finer points of the design then differentiate from the competitors yeah Yeah, exactly Mm. so that's the textbook approach how it ideally should be done how an expert would do it for a business and indeed how rachel does it for many of her clients uh, every day but it doesn't always or even often go by the textbook anyone who's run a business knows that things are often chaotic Things don't go according to plan. And it's the same for creating a brand identity as well, which brings us to our feature story. And now I'd like to share with you a, an interview that I had with Andre Eichmeyer, the founder of Vino Mofo. Vino Mofo is a huge Australian success story. It's a very significant um, wine uh, retailer, online retailer. And the story that you're about to hear is really quite incredible. Andre will share with us how just a one letter change made a massive difference in the trajectory of their business. What was behind the name? And we actually ended up building a business for nearly five years before Vino Mofo that was about a community of people that like minded like that. It started off as a review it. site, didn't it? I mean, it was mostly yeah. a review site, yeah. It was. And, you know, that wasn't particularly successful in, uh, you know, financial metrics, but it, but, it, but it did gather a bunch of people that, Felt like we did about what, mm-hmm. and that was that became the beginning of a community that was yep. driven. But the name of Vino Mofo didn't come from that. The name came from it was going to be. Uh, gosh, I haven't told this story for a while, but it's, so it was it was going to be called Vino Mojo, and it was a whole thing around because it was going to be like a wine deal site. It was actually going to be a group buying site. If you remember, two thousand eleven, uh, it's Groupon. Groupon and Groupon yep. and living social and all all of that. Um, and so Vino Mojo was like, get your mojo on. And we had all this li- language around. When we went to, we, we registered it and then it got, um, we got like a, a letter from a trademark attorney and it was an objection to the trademark by a public listed company okay. who had a wine called Mojo. Right. Like, mind you, this was like the Friday before the Monday we were going to launch. Oh. So it's like, you know, and I don't know if any of you listening have like, you know, been three days out from the launch of a website for something. That's probably There's a lot of shit happening, right? Yeah. There's a lot of moving parts, pretty stressful. <laughs> you probably know when you're ready. You, you're not sleeping much. We were in that state and got this letter, opened it. And so we were like, shit, um, what do we do? So I rang the CEO of this company. Thought my tactic would be just we would be so innocuous and just present ourselves as so harmless that, um, that they would feel sorry for us. Go, oh, fine. Okay, go for it. Yep. But so I just, you know, pleaded and presented our, our, our case. And they were like, oh, that's good to hear that you have no money because we've got lots of money. In fact, our founders are quite litigious and we, um, we're very protective of our brand. So uh, we'll tie this up, this up in court for a couple of years and, um, and good luck uh, working your way through that. And anyway, it was, 
it was a, I ended up getting off the phone going, ah, yes, I think we're going to have to change the name. So we were trying to change it and we didn't have any money for it. Uh, to, to redesign and we'd registered the Twitter account and the Facebook account back then and and we the website and we had a logo designed and so we were a bit stressed and we were just had this idea that if we just change like the name like by one letter. One letter. And people wouldn't even notice. We wouldn't even have to mention it. Just yep. cut, you know. Um, as long as the name name the name was available you'd be you'd be fine. Well this is exactly what the thinking was. And so we, there was like a, a naming session and I don't know if you've ever had a band or tried to come up Band for years. Yeah. It's, it's a pretty torturous process. And so where they're going, right, okay, Vino Mojo, Vino Mogo, Vino Moto, Vino Mogo, Vino Goto. <laughs> just like, you know, and then um, I think frustrated, it was actually Justin, who, um, who was like, ah, oh, let's just call it Vino Mofo for the motherfuckers who are trying to stop us from watching. I and mean, it was just a joke. And we just went, ah, be funny. And then went on, we tried to name it again and couldn't come up with anything. And then, because it was late, and I think we'd probably been drinking, uh, it started to creep in this conversation around, it would be funny though. And I was older than everyone else and had kids and felt more responsible. And I was like, we can't name ourselves wine motherfucker. It's not funny. <laughs> it's lowbrow and it's juvenile and no one will join. We yeah. need a name. And anyway, but then even I started going, but it wouldn't be funny. And so this is, anyway, we ended up just going, all right, what if we just, because we can't think of anything, let's just call it that for now. Yep. And it'd be funny, haha. Maybe we get some PR out of it. It won't work, yep. but, um, but we'll just do it now. And then in a couple of months, find the name. And I think in the context of like branding, it's really, understand, it's really important then to reflect on the fact that we didn't set out to call this Vino Mofo. Mm-hmm. So we didn't set out to go, hey, let's be wine motherfuckers. Let's, let's, um, let's create a challenge of brand and be a bit like, young and, and, and attitude That was none of that. It all happened by accident, essentially, a lot of it. Well, we, it's, this is what's interesting, what's in a name. We fought for years against yeah. certain um, perceptions in that name. But of course, what it ended up doing is opening up the doors for us and that lots of people thought that was great and thought it represented what they really wanted. And in a way, it did represent in quite an extreme format. For those that got it, Yep. Um, but we did want to change. We did want to break the establishment. Yep. Well, I actually remember the first time I heard the name because um, I've got a really close friend of mine who uh, who works in the wine industry and has for many years. And when he told me about you guys, uh, going back about sort of maybe six years ago or something like that, six, seven years ago, and I just remember thinking then, what a fantastic name. Like it was – really got my attention straight away and it sounded cool and edgy and you know even if it was by accident well obviously the story ends pretty well from what i can see yeah no the name really worked and i think what it did is that it might it for sure would have turned a few people off plenty of people just didn't get it and it just sounded like a good yep. name but then the people that really did and they became a real core community in the beginning they were like going they weren't just going, oh, I'll give this a try, and suddenly they're assessing the product and the fit for them and the blah, blah, blah. They sort of they went, fuck, yeah, that's for me. You know what I mean? And so they, uh, if, you, if you're a shop, they walk through the door going, this sounds like just like it's for me and nothing out there was for me before this. Yep. So they really arrive with some passion, with some expectation. Mm-hmm. But if you deliver on that, yep. then, um, then you've got a strong, loyal uh, member of your tribe, mm-hmm. and that's what really served us. So you can see from Andre's incredible story that the process of developing a brand identity is sometimes there's a lot of chance involved. Sometimes there's all the best planning goes out the window. Sometimes circumstance demands a response which takes you in a different direction. And this is backed up by Fred Shabesta at finder.com.au as well. You know, um, I would actually say that I've been completely uh, serendipitous in in this discovering this uh, journey and this path. And in the beginning, I, I just wanted to rank number one in Google for credit card um, as a keyword, right? And that's a, it's something that I'm very passionate about, search engine marketing and, and Google. But I think that's that's a, that's the sort of the beginning and the genesis because really, what that means, and what that's all about, is imagine how do you come up with a goal like that? Yeah. If you wake up in the morning and go, hey, I want to rank number one in Google for credit card. Like that's a, that's a, that's a goal. A, 
a goal like that, I think, comes from an idea about mastery. It's a mindset. It's a, hey, we're not ranking number one now. I'm not the best I can be in my life. What I am today is not what I am going to be in the future and what I want in the future. So how are we going to go about doing that? And I think that's that was the journey, right? And when you go and achieve a goal like that, so we did, and unfortunately we got penalized from, by Google in doing that, and that's why you, I'm sure you've seen the ninja sword. about that, yeah. Um, but when you, when you set a goal like that and you go and achieve it, in the process and in that journey, you tend to discover other ideas about yourself and about the market and about the business. Mm -hmm. And I think that we just keep resetting that goal and going on these new journeys yeah. and, and, and find a, you know, is, is really, as I said, it's in a constant state of beta. You know, I, I see our goal, um, you know, one day in the future, finder will die. And I mm -hmm. think our goal is to prevent that for as long as possible. Mm -hmm. And how are we going to do that? Well, we need to keep reinventing ourselves, keep becoming relevant. You know, I think I talked about this quite a bit, but it's, I believe in building a Phoenix company, not a unicorn company, something that keeps recreating itself. Right. Mm -hmm. And, so the idea is a mindset. It's a mindset that you adapt and you would you would you you um, are constantly improving yourself to be a better version, so as that in the future the things that you want and you, that you desire you can easily attain and you can have. So we've heard a couple of stories around journeys of brand identity and and so on. Really incredible insights there from some top entrepreneurs. Now, let's for a minute turn back to one of our branding experts, Rachel at The Healthy Brand Company, and let's just find out what she thinks is the most important factor for a good brand identity. I think the key thing for brand identity is fix and flex. So what? Fix and flex. <laughs> is that a nerdy thing? That's nerdy. <laughs> that is nerdy. That is very nerdy. We're into the brand nerd territory here. Okay. Fix and flex. So it's really important in today's really messy world. You know, we've got so many products out there, so many different communications. I mean, you can't walk past anything without it sort of shouting something at you. Yep. And so your brand has a very... You, you have to stand out within that crowd. So yep. you've got to be able to be recognised instantly within that. So it's really important that you actually are consistent. So every time people see your brand, they um, can recognise that it's you so that you actually then do get your impact over time. But it's the other side to that is flexibility. So a brand does need to be able to exist in all of those environments yep. and um, work well, work to the best of those environments. And that might mean it needs to be animated. It might mean that it needs to be, you know, needs to have like in a supermarket shelf in order for people to be able to choose which variant, then you're going to need the brand identity to be able to stretch across a number of variants. So not only can they see the brand, but then they can actually identify which of those variants they want. Yep. So that's where the sort of the fix and flex comes in. And that's what I would say is most important. So... If you're a new entrepreneur or you're a small business owner, you might be thinking, okay, well, how does all this relate to me and my business? Well, it, we've got the perfect answer. I'm now going to introduce another guest, um, Victoria Costa from Credit Fix Solutions. So they're a leader in credit repair in Australia. She's built this business from nothing to a national company in five years. She's an absolute powerhouse. She was a finalist for the 2019 Telstra Business Award. I think she she came in the top six. Incredible. Uh, she's a good friend of ours. She's a client at our agency, uh, WebBuzz. And uh, it was really great to talk to her for this particular episode because she can share some key insights into what it's really like down in the trenches, down in the small, business, small and medium-sized businesses for putting a brand together and creating a brand identity from scratch. So let, let's hear what Victoria says on that. Yeah, sure. Well, I, I needed help with it, right? Um, I'll be honest and put that out there. So I went along to a one day business course. It was free. And I suggest that any small business owner out there does that because you're only going to be as successful as how much knowledge you have. And um, so I put myself and it was a, a course. I just went to Parramatta one day and um, the guy running it was was fantastic. Um, Business Blueprint is is the name of the training company. Um, Dale Beaumont runs it, and he was just brilliant. And I thought, well, do I invest in myself and do I grow this? So that's what the small business owner needs to ask him or herself. 
do I want to grow this or am I happy being here? If you want to grow, you need to invest in yourself Mm -hmm. and you're only as good as what you know. So business course for me for 12 months, I invested. Yes, it was expensive for me at the time, but I invested. And within the next, look at me now, like national company, right? Couldn't have done it without it. And also just surround yourself with people who are smarter than you and richer than you, (laughs) (laughs) which is why I made you be my friend. So (laughs) well, now the truth comes out. (laughs) <laughs> You're too kind. And Victoria is our very first guest to go through one of our recurring segments called the Nerdometer. Have a listen to this. You've described yourself to me over the years a couple of times as a big nerd. Okay. Yeah. So we um, we now get to test just exactly how much of a nerd you are uh, because no – <laughs> Oh, yes. Oh, yes, very much. You didn't uh, tell me about this part. Um, well, I wanted it to be a surprise. So uh, that brings us to a special segment that we call the Nerdometer. <laughs> That's classic. <laughs> so, Victoria Costa, um, uh, on a scale of one to ten, when it comes to you know uh, all things technical marketing and and particularly around your business, um, the, the credit repair um, aspect. How much of a nerd do you think you are out of 10? Yeah, I'd pretty much say, well, actually, I'd have to say 8 out of 10 because I can't do the uh, CRM. Okay. I, I actually had to employ a bloody build company to do our new CRM system. So I'd yeah. have to pull it down to 8 because of that. 8. Okay. That's pretty solid, though. 8 out of 10 for nerdiness. Yeah. yeah. Well, lucky number 8, right? Lucky number 8. So the problem we set out to solve in this episode was how to create a brand identity that's so good it can take you from startup to potentially a $100 million valuation. We've heard from our brand experts, Rachel at The Healthy Brand Company and John Michael from The Image Group, on the technical process for creating a winning brand identity and why that's so important. And we've also heard some fascinating true stories from our entrepreneur guests, Fred from Finder, Andre from VinoMofo, and Victoria from Credit Fix Solutions. I hope you've already taken a lot of value out of the insights they've shared. For me, however, there are three powerful conclusions we can all draw from this episode. Firstly, brand is way more than just a logo. You'll recall there are actually four components to brand identity. Aside from the visuals, you should also be thinking about your verbal identity, that is your brand's tone of voice, the auditory component or how it sounds, a sensory perception, and even how your brand and your people behave. If you've only really focused on your logo to date, then these other components might just represent the biggest opportunities for leveraging your brand marketing in the short term. The second conclusion is that branding and brand identity complement direct response marketing. So if you plan to do a lot of digital marketing and lead generation, or maybe you're in e-commerce, go back and audit your brand identity. This will help you get the best ROI from your online advertising spend. The third and final conclusion I think we can draw is from Andre's story, and that's that the brand name really matters. The story of Vino Mofo showed that pushing the brand name to the edge caused it to more powerfully resonate with their target audience. Even though it was kind of an accident, they showed that by going narrow, not broad, the brand had a deeper connection to its customers. This was a key turning point in their scale phase to a $100 million valuation. So in your own branding, don't be afraid to take some risks. When you're all things to all people, you're also nothing to no one in particular. It's clear from the interviews with all our guests that there is no single definitive path to the right brand identity for any business, but that equally, the time and money you put into this is a worthwhile investment. We're coming to the end, but before we go, I've got a real treat for you. Each Nerd to Business episode features a segment called Nerd Under Pressure, where a guest has to share one killer hack or tip they recommend for you, our listeners. Let's find out who our nerd under pressure is today. So, Rachel, uh, we now come to a segment called Nerd Under Pressure. 
So Nerd Under Pressure is uh, where we uh, we do. We put you under pressure. You are the branding nerd. And uh, we're, going, we're asking here for uh, one killer hack uh, that you can provi- provide to entrepreneurs and business people for designing a great brand identity. So I'm going to give you about four or five seconds of thinking time now. Okay, over to you. I would say test it in situ. So okay. once you have the concepts, is have a look. If you're in the supermarket, test it on a super, as a supermarket shelf, uh, shelf layout. Yep. If you're um, with, uh, in the environment that it's going to be communicated, mm-hmm. uh, whatever wherever it is, um, I would always go on, whether it's web or um, outdoor or yep. what have you, is just go and test it within the busy environment in which it exists yep. and check that it stands out against competitors. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's a great tip, yeah. Yeah, so of course, I mean, that's really logical, but a lot of people don't do that. No. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So thanks for listening to the first episode of Nerds of Business. If you've enjoyed it, please spread the word on social media with your friends and colleagues. We really want to try and help as many entrepreneurs and businesses as possible. If you've got a question or some feedback, we'd love to hear from you. You can engage with us at webbuzz.com.au forward slash nerds. That's webbuzz.com.au forward slash nerds. That's where we live. That's where you can find us. So feel free to reach out and say hello. I want to thank all our guests and the team at WebBuzz for helping me put this show together. We'll be back in two weeks with our next episode, which is on brand positioning and how to annoy the hell out of your competitors. Until then, I'm your host, Darren Moffat, and I look forward to nerding out with you next time. Bye for now.